Now let's uh, stand together and I'll read the text from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and ask that you would give us faith to believe in order to understand. May you bless this word to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> I trust that today that um, I won't just preach a pie-in-the-sky message that sends you all home feeling happy and good, but one that can actually benefit and bless you. And while we're doing that, we don't want to lose sight of the fact of the physical ascension of Jesus. I mean, that is an amazing reality. And it was one which the disciples were eyewitnesses to that they, that really no doubt spurred them in their ministry and in their uh, witness to the world. Uh, the apostles' lives and their testimony and, and ministry could not, would not make any sense at all if the message they were proclaiming, they had not actually witnessed. In other words, if they were going around saying that we saw Jesus rise from the dead and that he spoke to us for 40 days, um, it wouldn't have given the impetus and the fire and power that, uh, with which they went out and spread the message of the gospel over the world. And not only them, but I often think about us. We are Celts, all of us here who are White people, we're the Caucasian race, Celtic people, and we were what, the, uh, what Julius Caesar called barbarians, Gauls and Visigoths and Goths and, and steeped in paganism. And there were Catholic priests, there were priests that came from Rome and from the Near East and um, went out and evangelized the barbarians. And that's us. And we became Western Christianity. That could never have happened if it was just based on myths. Because they confronted the idolatry. They confronted the paganism. And head on, the spiritual powers that, that um, like St. Patrick going to Ireland, for example. And he went uh, over the, about 380 to 430, something like that. <clears throat> and... These Druids had a great deal of spiritual power. But the one, the one Druid priest to whom St. Patrick had been sold as a slave when he was a child heard that he was coming and set himself on fire because he didn't want to meet him because he knew that what St. Patrick had would be stronger than what he had. And that's how St. Patrick evangelized Ireland, by confronting the powers of the Druids and overcoming them. He had some that would levitate themselves up into the air and when he prayed, they came crashing to the ground and 
No wonder everybody turned to the Lord. You know, it was like total confrontation. And that's really what the ascension of Christ is about. It's about authority and power. Our scripture in Ephesians says that, that the eyes of our hearts need to be opened. Like Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples just before he ascended, it says he opened their understanding. He opened the eyes of their hearts so that they could understand the scriptures and the things that were in the scriptures and how he had fulfilled them. You see, Jesus is not just an isolated event in the history of God. It's like he is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament history and doctrine. And in so many ways, uh, it was prefigured time and again. And even the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Uh, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued from, uh, with power from on high, until you receive the promise of the Father. What was the promise of the Father? That he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. And Jesus ascended to heaven as a man, received the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and gives it to his body. That's how we receive it, because we are part of him. And the reason I said pie in the sky is because there is a, um, there is a body of truth in the New Testament that is often overlooked, and it has to do with our union with Christ. Right now I'm reading a little book, just a little booklet, sort of. It's more than a booklet. It's a book by F.J. Hugel. And the title is Bone of His Bone. And uh, it's the kind of book that you read through once, and then you go back and read it carefully. But a um, number of years ago, I was preaching through, it's been about four or five years ago, I think, I was preaching through the series of Easter, like Easter and Pentecost and, and all these different things and, um, that have to do with those. I wasn't following the lectionary, just doing a series, then Arlene Abbott asked me if I would preach on the ascension. Well, I had never preached on the ascension before. The eyes of my heart had never been opened to the ascension. I mean, I knew about it, and I believed in it, of course, but I had no idea the importance that it carried and, and how it would impact us. And so, um, so I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pray and ask the Lord if he would give me some some mess a message on the ascension. Well, I ended up being at least two, I think, messages on the ascension because I was so astounded at the importance for us spiritually in our union with Christ. And it was then that I really saw how much Jesus had become a man and that when he ascended to the throne of heaven, he ascended as a man, the perfect glorified man. And it impacted me so much more in the, even, in our, even in my understanding of the crucifixion and his uh, victorious life. You see, man fell and man had to be restored by someone who of his own free will and with the resources that are available to man totally overcome, totally resist temptation, totally overcome sin, in all of its forms, and then to give his life as a ransom for us. And to represent us in every way that we needed to be represented. And so he represents us in his death. And it's because of Jesus dying as a man that he can pay for the penalty of our sin. And it's because of our union with him, the fact that it's counted to us judicially that we died in Christ, that our sins are forgiven. So the very basis of forgiveness of sins and salvation has to do with our union with Christ. We died in him. It is counted to us judicially. It's imputed to us, the Bible says. That means it's just put on our account. We died in Christ. And um, that is so important to understand for our peace. That when Jesus died, it's like I died. When I have faith in him and believe in him, that my sins are gone. You know, because I died. I paid the price. I paid the penalty of sin in him. He paid it, of course, but it's counted to me so that the price for my sins is paid. You know, I don't owe anything anymore. I'm free. And it's called a ransom. It's uh, like buying a slave, you know. You, you pay the price of their captivity. Fact is, that's what St. Patrick was doing, going back to Ireland. First thing he wanted to do was go back to the Druid priest and pay for his freedom because he had run away when he was 15 and escaped to England where he was converted to Christianity. And now he's going back as a missionary. 
But like I said, before he got there, the priest set himself on fire and burned himself to death. So, um, but Jesus paid for my sin, but I am united to him. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 says that we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We are in union with Christ in every way. He is one of us and he is, he is the head of a new race. He is the beginning of a whole new people. And when we are born into his kingdom and we are united with him, we, um, it's called the new birth. It's like a new life now. It, and this, um, all these different aspects are a part of that. I am um, so glad for the scriptures that were read today and, and just the uh, beautiful way that, um, that you read them. I, I'd like to read a little bit more from Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> we have sort of a summary again. Chapter 1 is sort of pie in the sky. I mean, it's just wonderful. Everything is great and glorious. But chapter 2 makes it a little more practical. Um, Sue read that so beautifully about Jesus being exalted. Do you know what that means for you? Paul is praying the eyes of your understanding would be opened so that you would know the exceeding greatness of his power toward you who believe. When you believe, God's power is released. It's like um, judicially, things are applied to us. By faith, we experience them and they become real in our life. And so um, we need to have our eyes opened that what is judicially ours would become experientially ours. You know, that's why you get peace when you know your sins are forgiven. Because you believed it. And um, then it becomes yours by experience, you see. And you get peace. And that's how all these other aspects work, too. It is so important for us to realize that we are sanctified. We are made holy so that we are actually holy in our experience and life. We are made holy by faith, just like we are saved by faith. We are sanctified, the Bible says. That's the word used for made holy or set apart as something sacred and holy. That's why the Bible calls us saints because judicially we're holy. You know, we have been sanctified in Christ. And these two process, processes are often spoke about, spoken about in Scripture with the same word except that in one case they are both in the same verse. And it is, see if I can quote it, it says that um, uh, by one act, see, I can't, I'm sorry, but it's those who are being sanctified and those who are sanctified are both in the same verse. So, um, so we are both made holy, we are pronounced holy, and we are in a process of being made holy in our personal lives. So let's look at this, Ephesians 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, that says right down at the bottom, right? You he made alive. And that corresponds, of course, to Jesus' resurrection. The life has to do with the fact that in him, just like it says in Romans 6, that if we have been united together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And those two are always together. You know, like in our experience, the more we want to live in Christ, the deeper death we need to die. The deeper we need to be united with Christ in his death, the more real it needs to become. And all spiritual blessings are like that. If we're not willing to die with Christ, how in the world are we going to live with him? You know, in our personal experience. But he says, he made us alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Without a belief in, the, in a personal devil, it's like walking around, I think, with one eye closed. And I believe that God often gets blamed for things that the devil is responsible for. You know, it's... Um, I can't explain the devil altogether, you know, his origins and all that. But, um, but I, I am absolutely convinced of a personal devil. I believe I've encountered him many times. And, and through the understanding that God has given me concerning the truths about the ascension, I'm not afraid of him. 
you know. I believe he can be absolutely overcome in every circumstance. It doesn't matter what it is. And I believe there are believers, there are Christians who have done so uh, throughout history. Under every conceivable circumstance, there are people who have chosen to be faithful to Christ to the point of death even and, um, and leaves us all without any excuse. You know, things we have to face are often so much less than what other people have faced before us. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here. Which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. There are three things that scripture says are of utmost and ultimate importance, and that is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest is love. And the commandment of God can be summed up in two things. Loving God with all one's heart, with all one's mind and soul and strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself. Those two things sum up all the commandments of God. And no one can love who does not know God. No one can love who does not know the love of God. And no matter what you're contemplating, whether it is the crucifixion, we lay down our lives in Christ out of love for what he has done, or we don't do it. There is no other power that will empower us to live for God, live for Jesus, deny ourselves other than the love of God. If we haven't experienced the love of God, we can't do it. It's not possible. So, and so it is with every aspect of our spiritual walk. There are two things that have to happen. One is that our life must be laid down. That is our selfishness, our carnal nature, that which he is speaking about here. Last Sunday we talked about overcomers. Overcoming the world, the flesh, and the devil. And incidentally, this thing about Jesus ascending and being seated on the throne, one of the promises to the overcomers is, to him who overcomes, I will give to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat with the Father on his throne. So um, that's, that's what we're talking about today, is power to overcome or power to, um, to rule. So let's go on here. I'm, I'm uh, t getting lost in the details here. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. I, I just can't. This is so, so important. This is the most important thing in the Bible. To know, not just to believe, but to know that God loves you. That if you'd have been the only person alive, Jesus would have died for you that he cares about you. He feels your pain. He knows your concerns. He is intimately acquainted with you and he wants with all his heart to bless you and to help you and to free you and to do whatever needs to be done. And because of it, he paid the ultimate price. He laid his life down. And his only word to us is, that uh, if I lay down my life for you, you also ought to lay down your lives for one another. So, but first that we have to believe that he loves us. He, and I think even there, God needs to open the eyes of our hearts so that we can know the love that Christ had toward us. Because everything depends on it. Even when we were dead in trespasses, you made us alive together with Christ. See, there we are in union with Christ again. Alive together with Christ. You weren't even born yet when Jesus was resurrected. But in God's mind, you were resurrected with him. It's because of him that you can live. And not just live physically, but live eternally. He became mortal so that we could become immortal. Jesus said, he that lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, if you believe it, you will experience it you will experience the power of immortality. 
the peace and assurance that will allow you to, to uh, die with Christ, to die for Christ, you know, um, or even to lay down your life for Christ. But anyway, um, in Revelation it says that they overcame him, that is Satan and his allies, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's people who know what it means to be immortal. Paul said, if in this life only we had hope in Christ, we'd be of all men most miserable. Why? Because we're laying our lives away. We're giving our lives away. You know, we're laying our life down. But, but it's because we, are, we believe in immortality. And uh, that immortality can be experienced this side of the grave as well. And it actually begins now. It needs to begin now. <clears throat> All right, let me go again. Let's try again. When we were dead and trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, there you have it. And this is what the whole message is about, isn't it? That when Jesus ascended, we also potentially and judicially ascended with him. That's why we have authority, because we too are kings and priests unto our God. What does that mean? Now I can go into a whole other sermon. You know, um, that scripture in Revelation says we are kings and priests unto our God. What does a pri Well, first of all, let me say that Jesus was the ultimate priest king, which is the oldest form of rulership that we know about. Melchizedek in the Bible, this mysterious, mis not mystical, it was mystical because it was mysterious, not mythical. He was a real person. But uh, Melchizedek was this priest king. He was priest of the Most High God, and he was the king of Jerusalem, king of Salem, which later became Jerusalem. So he's, the Bible in Hebrew says he was king of righteousness, by, by his name means king of righteousness, and he was king of Salem, which is king of peace. So he was king of righteousness and king of peace. The perfect foreshadowing or prefiguring of Jesus Christ himself. King of righteousness and king of peace. And he was the priest of the most high God. And Hebrews is all full of how Jesus is our high priest. Well, um, just a few things. I mean, first of all, Melchizedek was not a priest by the order of a carnal commandment, like the Ten Commandments, or not the Ten Commandments, but the Law of Moses. The Law of Moses had how a person became a priest. Melchizedek was above that. He, it says he was not made a priest by the um, Law of a Carnal Commandment, but he was a priest by the power of an endless life. In the Bible is not recorded either his beginning or his end, which is also prefiguring Jesus. Jesus existed before he came, and he has no end. So he is Jesus as our high priest. He always lives to make intercession for us. And that power of an endless life is what we need if we want to be, enter into his priesthood. Enter into priesthood with him. We are kings and priests unto our God. What does a priest do? A priest represents God to the people and the people to God. So the first thing you'd have to do if you want to be a priest is you have to become one of the people. And I can't say, tell you how important that is. There are very few people who are one of the people. It's always them. Them. When we pray, we pray for them. Instead of praying for us. And it's more than just words. It's something that's in our hearts that's like Jesus had when he became incarnate in human flesh. He came down into the world so that he, he could become one of us. And we have to become one of us if we want to enter into that priestly ministry where we can be a true representation to people of God and represent people to God in prayer and intercession and um, praying for their salvation and things like that. So, um, so this is all, but this kingly part is more about the ascension. <clears throat> let's go on, let's go on reading here. He raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I'd like to say that, <clears throat> that to, in some measure at least, that what I'm sharing with you today is actually my experience. Um, the things that have changed in my life have not changed by me trying so hard and trying to be good and trying to do what's right. And I am committed to do what's right, that's true. But what changes in my life uh, the changes that have been made in my life have been made by acts of God. They've been made by the authority and power of God. And sometimes he would change things that I didn't even know needed to be changed, you know? And then I would find out about it afterward. But whenever he does that, it's like you know that you'll never be the same again. You couldn't be. It's not, not possible. So, um, so it's like living in a box. And then the box is little by little taken away until you're free. You're not living in the box anymore and you can't go back because there's no more box. You know? It has been taken away. It's, been, it's gone. You can never be that person again because your box has been removed. And God is the only one who can do that. Till he does, we stay in the box. You know? We stay with what we were born with. And um, I was saying last Sunday about giving ground to Satan, legal kinds of things, you know? And that's what this is all about. This is all about legal stuff. You know, we have Jesus now sitting, sitting on the throne, name above every name, is absolutely in charge, and as a man, he rules. And, um, and some of us, myself in particular, uh, were born with things that um, the Bible calls the sins of the fathers. It's like ground that has been given generationally, from generation to generation, the same problem, same thing. You can trace it back your lineage, and I think all of you could probably do the same thing. You say, well, that's just my family, you know, that's just the way we are. Maybe a uh, temper or whatever it is. For me, it was a very, very strong spirit of sectarianism. It's like I couldn't even think of other people in the same way as myself. I was different from the day I was born. You know, I always wore different clothes. I had different hairstyle. I, everything about me was different. I talked a different language. I was just different. But it wasn't just the hairstyle. It wasn't just the clothes. And it wasn't just the language. It was something inside of me that had been passed down from generation to generation that said, you are different. And until God changed that, um, I wouldn't be fit to be your pastor for sure. So, um, because I'd always be preaching down to you. But I'm one of you. I'll never again be different. I can remember the time when God showed me that I wasn't alone. And I'll never again be alone. I can be up here in front of you and I'm not alone. You know, I was, um, when I was doing uh, Paul's father's memorial service, there were about 350 people there. And they weren't just average people. You know, these were people that I, that I knew, knew me too. And they knew that things were different, but they didn't know exactly how. And it was a little hard for me to get up there in front of them, you know. So I asked Jesus before I went up, I said, Jesus, would you, make sh would you let me know the conscious presence that I know when I get up there that I'm not alone? And he did. I knew that I wasn't alone. So, um, so those are things that he does. But um, I don't know exactly. I always like to say, you know, uh, how in the world did I get from where I was to where I am? And how will I get back from where I am to where I was? <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <clears throat> How's that? <laughs> Amen. Okay. So I'd like to just uh, say a little bit more specifically about the ascension. The further we want to go in our spiritual life, the deeper the death to our carnal nature. And um, the crucifixion of self, laying down our life, depends wholly, completely on love. As I said before, it's the only power that will allow us to do it. We can know what we ought to do. We can have faith for it and it still doesn't happen until the love of God compels us. Love of God, the Bible says, constrains us. It moves us to lay our life down and then we can move forward. <clears throat> and um, I 
you know, I, could, I should probably preach the whole sermon just on that. But John 17, Jesus said, uh, to, he was praying to the Father, said, You have loved them, talking about believers, as you have loved me. Now, if you can believe that, that God loves you just like he loved Jesus, or just like he loves Jesus. You have loved them as you have loved me. The ascension has to do with victory and authority. <clears throat> it's about sitting on the throne. It's about ruling. And the things that we rule over in this world as Christians are we rule over sin. We rule over our carnal nature. It does not have the power over us anymore. It does not have the final word. And it's like you can look at yourself and you can look at a problem and say in faith, this is going to be conquered. This is going to be overcome. Why? Because you're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You have the power of heaven ready at your disposal when you just simply put your faith in it and believe in it. I was talking about the sins of the fathers. That's where I got off track. Um, take back that territory. It can stop with you. It doesn't have to go to future generations. That's taking back legal territory. It's like going into the land of Canaan and conquering it. But our problem is just the same as theirs. They were promised the whole land, and Joshua in his day took about one-third of it. That's all they had faith for. And that's how it is with us. You know, we can look at the problems of our life, and we can just accept them and say, well, this is where we are, you know. Or we can have faith to overcome and um, not just in our own personal life, but, but whatever confronts us. But take back that territory and, and take it back for God. And it's a step at a time. The Lord told Joshua, he said, wherever you walk, there I'll give it to you. Wherever your feet go. That's what he told Abraham as well. Wherever you go, wherever you walk, I'll give that to you. And so it's one step at a time. Wherever we walk. That's ours, and we can walk in faith and confidence that, that we are overcoming in, in Christ. The ascension is about rule. <clears throat> it's about Jesus sitting on the throne. Now, I don't know if you have a problem with that or not, that Jesus is in charge, that he is ruling. You know, the uh, seven seals of Revelation are about authority. And there was no one found worthy to open them except Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, um, it says. And he opens the seal, and it's op they're opened over um, periods of time. I believe it's over the whole history of mankind. And he is the one who releases the cataclysmic forces that change and alter the world. And I, um, I don't pretend to begin to know why he does what he does. You know, we respond to it, and, but I believe it with all my heart. I absolutely believe that he's in charge. But I also believe that there's a certain self-limitation that, um, that God has taken upon himself when he allows free will. Free will is free will, or it's not free will. You know, and um, so that is still that is still something to consider as well. But um, but Jesus, I believe, is absolutely overall in charge. Scripture tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and that includes our own. But it also includes every problem that you can look out and see. It's not people that we're fighting. It is spiritual forces. And when you are living in the heavenlies, then you can have faith to overcome. You can have faith in prayer. Um, you can have faith in your actions. I was, uh, you know, one of the things I've struggled with a lot is the feeling of futility. I used to go around the country preaching, and, and, um, and I just didn't see the results I would have liked to have seen. And actually, I finally sort of broke under that feeling of futility. I was right out here at the corner turning up here one day, and I was thinking about this, and about this whole thing of futility. And the Lord brought a verse to my mind, 
that impacted me tremendously. I, I, I will never be the same again. But um, what he said was that we know that all of our, that our labor in vain is not, uh, pardon me, for we know that our labor in the Lord is not, not in vain. That's a verse in the Bible. I probably didn't quote it exactly right. But it was like at that moment I knew that whatever you ever do in the name of Jesus will have its fruit. It will not be in vain. It can't be. It's not possible. We know that whatever we do in the Lord is not in vain. And that is so important when you are wrestling with principalities and powers because they are pernicious. They are persistent. Their kinds of problems don't give way easily. They fight back. And, um, and whether it's a personal problem, some, like I said, some stronghold that has been passed down from gener generation to generation, or whatever it is, when you begin to attack that, you can expect all hell to break loose, you know? And it'll, be, it'll come at you harder than it ever has. And you'll think that, you know, this is just not uh, going to work, or whatever. But, um, but just persist in faith, and you will break through. Your labor, in vain, your labor in the Lord is not in vain because you have spiritual authority. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and this spiritual darkness, it says, and, and all these kinds of things. And, and if you don't know about this, it's, it's, um, you've got one hand tied behind your back for sure. <clears throat> but I am sure that, um, that the Lord will make this real to us to the extent that, um, that we are ready for it. You know, even in, even in speaking, it's like um, I've got something really important that I need to say to you, and it keeps going in and out of my mind. So. But um, uh, God wants you to know about this. I know that he does. And... Um, just pray for me right now. I, I want to say one thing in closing that I think just sort of sums this whole thing up, but it's, it keeps escaping me. <laughs> well, <clears throat> let me close with this. What is judicially true may be experientially true. So what is true in the heavens, that we have authority and we have power, can be experientially true in our lives too, as we believe it, trust in it, and move forward, believing that no matter what comes, love not your life unto death, be willing to lay your life down, and uh, he will bring it to pass. I'm sure that he will. So uh, I'm going to have to run. We have uh, family coming on the uh, 1210 boat. Kay has uh, family coming today, and I'm going to have to go down and pick them up. And so I won't be at your meeting, but the Lord bless you. I'm sure you'll handle it just fine. And uh, give you a good week. And I trust that the ascension, just the wonder of it and the presence of it, what it means to you will be made known to you as you meditate on it and um, allow Jesus to speak to you. What I couldn't say, he wants to say to you personally. So ask him what it was. Okay? God bless you. Let's, um, let's stand together for uh, the benediction. And then we'll, um, uh, could we have the doxology? That'd be okay. And we'll dismiss with that. <clears throat>